evening, good evening, good evening, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, Weather Brains episode number 951 for the 8th of April, 2024. This is Eclipse Day. Many folks have spent the day watching the show in the sky, the celestial show. Hopefully, a few uh, ventured into the land of totality. It was a successful day today. Uh, clouds were kind of iffy. Some folks had a great shot. Some folks did not. Where, where we are, we had a uh, partial eclipse, and uh, we were able to see about the first half of it. And then the clouds really thickened up, and it started to rain. And uh, But anyway, we'll talk about that. It's going to be a homegrown show. I'm excited. I, I can't wait for this. The, the, we have no guests, just us. And we get to air out everything that's on our mind. And for those that don't know, this is the pre-show. The actual show begins at about uh, seven minutes. But this is the magical part of the program where we do three things. Commonly, we share boring personal stories, humorous anecdotes. And from time to time, we say some really outrageous things. And we might just do that in the main show here. So uh, anyway, uh, homegrown shows sometimes can be really, really good. We got Bill Murray, who's in the Do Drop In, listening to Charlie yeah. Daniels, an uneasy writer. You ever heard the song Uneasy Writer by Charlie Daniels? One of my favorite songs, James, especially the part where he says all that hair fell out from underneath his hat. Yeah, yeah. Kicked, up, kicked old green teeth right in the knees. No, I kicked him in the knees, man. Old green teeth. Uh, that's a classic. I and mean, most people watching had no idea what we're talking about, but. I'm just go search brother John Birch and nobody knows what that means either. No, no, they have no idea, but you just go search uneasy rider by Charlie Daniels. And I want to say it came out in about 1972. Yeah. So, um, I, I played a, that song for my kids and they thought it was the funniest thing. Ever. <laughs> um, yeah, there, there were some very bizarre songs that were out, uh, back then. Um, uh, I had one that you, popped you remember up hot, rod, hot rod Lincoln. That was one of my favorites. Oh yeah. Hot, hot rod Lincoln. Um, I, I, sometimes <laughs> I'll just play these, you know, seventies radio, you know, channels of these music services. And, uh, the seventies channel the other day played wildwood weed by Jim Stafford. That's another classic. Um, uh, you don't hear a lot of yeah. wildwood weed songs anymore. Um, so much of that stuff they would never, ever, ever play on the radio or anywhere else. But it's still floating around in the digital world here. Um, all right. So let's see here. i got to rearrange things. I did a, I had to go on every radio station known to man this morning. They wanted a live update for the eclipse. Now, where, where did you do the eclipse thing today? I'm in Batesville, Arkansas. Well, and it was well, spectacular. Yeah, we'll, we'll hold the important eclipse talk. Yeah. <laughs> eclipse talk for the actual show here. Or um, as they say here in Batesville, Arkansas, the eclipse. Well, yeah. What's, what's wrong with that, man? It's a no, eclipse. I, I, guy, uh, the guy in the restaurant just now was like, are you here for the eclipse? I said, yeah, I was here for the eclipse. So I, I was crushed over the weekend. Um, I didn't get a wow. chance to see Neil. Neil spoke on Sunday and oh. I spoke on Saturday. And so I, I had to leave. And I, was, I was, I had to leave when I finished my talk because I had a function in Birmingham and I, this was in Mobile. So I had to leave. He came in as I was leaving and his talk was on Sunday, uh, but he what didn't fly that? in until Saturday. I was mm -hmm. hoping that we would have a weather brains, extraordinaire uh, dinner Friday night. Yeah, um, you could have got a Felix's fish camp on the causeway, James. Well, that's too far away. That's that's too much work. We we <laughs> I we went to the uh one next door to where I was staying. Um they um it was at a Homewood Suites. Uh West Mobile. Kind of, yes. Um yeah. in fact, we actually stayed there ten years ago when our son played high school baseball. They played a playoff game against Baker, but Next door to the um, Homewood Suites there, there is a bonefish grill, which uh, I know that's not the classic South Alabama thing, but hey. That's a chain. I mean, you know, you, you need, just you need to go to sometimes convenience, convenience is kind of a big deal. I just walked over there and uh, 
uh, Kevin Laws of the Weather Service in Birmingham came by, and they were so nice. The, the lady that uh, was the manager said, uh, this one's on me. She, she paid for our dinner. I mean, how really? nice is that? Yes. Did Dr. Keith Blackwell come, James? Is he doing well? Uh, I did not see Keith. I did not see him. Uh, so Last I don't time have an I went, update well, Ellen and I went to Felix's a few weeks ago, but I went to Felix's with him about, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, and I had a wonderful time. Well, we, we had a good time. It was um, John Gordon <laughs> spoke before me. Now, now John whips me into a total frenzy because, you see, I want to be like John Gordon when I grow up. And for those that don't know, John is the uh, meteorologist in charge of the National Weather Service in Louisville. And uh, he is a spark plug. He is the he's up there at a 12 out of 10 on the energy level when he speaks. And uh, I, I want to be like John Gordon one day. But whenever he speaks, he just totally whips me into a frenzy. So when I got up there, there's no telling who I made mad in that room um, because he got me just totally into a frenzy. But John was at the top of his game uh, for his talk. I mean, it was good. Uh, but, uh, we had, uh, obviously Dr. Jake and what, what I'd like to do if he can come on the, I don't know if he can come on the show tonight, but it's for him to kind of go through his talk on Sunday because I couldn't hear it. Uh, and right. to my knowledge, they didn't record any of the sessions, which is too bad because they had some really, really good speakers. But anyway, we'll see if we can review mobile. Jen, how you doing? I'm doing great. I made it to my are couch. You a, and... Are you a clip? Are you <laughs> eclipsed out? Oh my goodness. I I don't have words to describe how awesome that was. I mean, that was just so amazing. So it was, I just walked right outside and I was in totality and it I wasn't I didn't know what to expect and it was just so amazing. And uh, I was I actually got emotional and it was it was just God's splendor. That's all I can say. It was just so amazing. So I recorded it Darn, right we, before we, it we, started. We, 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 we're going to hold the full reviews okay, until we start I will, the yeah, show I'll here. Okay, I'll keep my mouth shut. Yeah, I'm, so I'm more like, out. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, and I will say, and again, uh, we, we had clouds that moved in here about, oh, about, we, we didn't uh, we didn't make it to the peak here because the, the sky was cloudy and started to rain, but the, the beginning was pretty cool. In fact, I, uh, I, I stuck in this drawer these glasses that I saved from 2017. <laughs> um <laughs> Because yeah, th th this is part this is part of the batch that Coach Saban called and wanted 500 glasses three days before the 2017 eclipse. And why he called did me, you, I wasn't quite sure. Did you say I was able? Making them? No, no, I was able to find them miraculously, and and I, I kept one, knowing that we would have one in 2024, and I, I will keep this in this drawer, knowing we have another one in 2045 that will actually come through here. Um, Yay. can y'all see that? That's yeah. what it looked like in Birmingham, um, where L was. I was in Batesville, Arkansas, but that's not a bad look right there. No, that's really great. I'll, uh, so I'll pull that. up the, I'll pull up mine. I zoomed in a little yeah, bit. I, what, what yeah, I can do. I, I'll, I'll, yeah. Oh, wow. Yours is better than mine. It was awesome. Well, now here's the one thing I, I noticed. Mine? mine was terrible compared to that. I got a tip from somebody on Discord. I took a photo. Well, I, that was from my actual camera. So I waited for oh, totality okay. and I took a better picture. And then I zoomed in real close after I took the picture. Let's welcome our television yeah. viewers here. We're at the top of the hour. We're about to get started here. This is going to be a homegrown show tonight. So, uh oh, Williams <laughs> Otter Pilot. Pilot. Uh, yeah, is that your name? Find... No, it's that silly otter thing. Don't don't worry about it. I'll just <laughs> hang up on it. <laughs> it tries to there's a lot of things wrong things. here um all right let, let's get the uh oh. and so we we still play weather band for this week right yep one more week even though it's outdated right. but it'll work all right so uh here we go in uh, five four three two one join the american meteorological society by becoming a member of the band the AMS Weather Band is a global community of weather enthusiasts dedicated to learning and sharing their love of science. Visit amsweatherband.org to learn more and join the band today. You've heard James say it a million times, respect the polygon. 
at Weather Call, we call, text, and email you when you're in the Polygon. So in a way, we make the Polygon better. With solutions for personal use, businesses, schools, pools, playgrounds, and RVs, there's a Weather Call solution that's right for you. Check us out at weathercallservices.com. You're listening to Weather Brains. They're kind of a big deal. You heard it. Bill Curtis says we're kind of a big deal. Hey, this is Weather Brains. This is episode number 951 for the 8th of April, 2024, Eclipse Day. Yeah, we got a lot to talk about it. I'm very excited because from time to time we do these, this is just going to be a homegrown show. No guests, just us. And so the... uh, and we're a little thin here, I see tonight. I see Dr. Jacobs has joined us. We got Bill Murray and Jen. Everybody else needs to, uh, I think they're eclipsed out. I think they have an eclipse hangover. Uh, but we we do have uh, Jen Naramore, who was in the path of totality today. I was. So, Jen, give, give us your review of your experience. I, I have never done the totality thing before. So, how was it? I've never done it either. And it was just, it's actually hard to describe because I had no idea what to expect. So I went outside, I had my glasses and and just sat out there and, and 101.7, our classic rock station had a playlist of just amazing music to, you know, bring in the eclipse. And so I had that running in the background and I just waited and tried to take a few photos and I just was having a hard time. And then once it got closer to the time of totality, I start, I just ran my uh, camera or my uh, video recorder on my phone and just let it roll. And when it got completely dark and all my solar lights popped on, I was really just amazed and the sounds and they started playing blinded by the light from <laughs> Manfred man in the background. Yeah, I'm like, okay, man, this yeah. is awesome. And so I just was absorbing the whole atmosphere and I actually got emotional because it got so dark and it was just neat. And I got my my real camera out and I started taking a couple of photos. And so I was able to take a couple of shots and then I zoomed in real close. But that's what it looked like for me up here in West Central Ohio. And it was just, to me, it was God's splendor. You know, it was just creation. And it was just so cool to be a part of. And I could hear my neighbors, you know, hooping and hollering. Um, and then it started getting light again. And then everything was just back to where it was. And in the middle of it all, Cece the cat started crying. And it was just interesting because she didn't cry at all before or after, but she started crying in the middle of it. Probably like, why is it dark? Is it time to go to bed? It was just very interesting. And I'm just so glad I was here to be a part of it. And I didn't have to fight the traffic. I didn't have to. I just walked right outside. And it was just really, it was really amazing. So, so let me ask you this. So, so you were experiencing this. I, as I see it, there's kind of two ways of doing it. Number one, you come as a photographer. You know, you, you want to shoot this thing. You got all your camera gear and and you set up and you're, you're working. In the other way, it's just to experience it with no cameras, no phones, no doodads. So mm-hmm. you, you sounds like you had kind of had a hybrid experience with phones and cameras and the experience. I did. I wanted to, it was mainly experience because I am not a very good photographer and I found myself getting distracted with my phone trying to get a shot. And so I eventually put the phone away and I knew I wanted to run my video to watch it get dark. So I, and I've already watched that twice because it was just so cool. And to hear my own self just going, whoa, I mean, it was just, it was really neat. Um, But I know, but I have a friend of mine who is, her husband's a photographer and she sent me his shot and it was amazing. And so if you're a photographer and you got an opportunity to go to do that, that you got some, probably some shots of the lifetime because it was just so amazing to be. And I can understand why people traveled to go see it. I totally can. Mm -hmm. Now I I had no idea what it was all about until you experience it. You really don't know. And, you know, I I think I would just go for the experience. I don't understand Mm -hmm. photography. I'm not that Mm -hmm. good at it. I mean, and in, in the one, what's funny, goodness, and this is no exaggeration. I, I've received over 12,000 pictures, 12,000. <laughs> wow. They were coming I did, in I at the rate of, to, I didn't even bother to send you one because I knew better. <laughs> oh my word. They were coming in at the rate of five per second. Like, it sounded like bullets in here. 
And, and I, you know, as I, of course, I, it, it's going to take me a long time to see all of them. And I, I will see all of them. I will see all of them. It might take me a month, but I will see them all. But as I glance at some of them, they're, you know, it's people holding up their phone and they're trying to get pictures and it's just not good. And, and I, I, I think I would want to put the phone down because you, you're going to have some really good photographers that are going to capture this thing. And if you're not a photographer, just put the phone down and experience it. Just enjoy it. Mm -hmm. I think that's the way. Mm -hmm. I would do it. Yeah. I like you, Jen, I might just set the phone over there to the side and just roll some video that just rolls, but, uh, I, I would be an experienced guy. So speaking of those that traveled, Bill Murray journeyed into the great state of Arkansas and yeah, uh, I have to really drop in tonight. Give credit to Tomerberg, James, because I thought his visualization of the forecast was superior. And it was um, his, I, his graphics were outstanding. And, and I picked Batesville, Arkansas because of him. Um, and it didn't hurt that they had a New Hampton with it with a decent rate. So I, I decided to hit the road yesterday about 4 30 and come up here. I hit a deer um, about a mile short of my destination last night. Really, it hit me. Um, and fortunately, there was no severe damage. I, I saw this deer. And I slowed way, way, way down, and I thought, I'm good. I'm just going to ease past him. And right when I got even with him, he slammed into the side of my car. And I thought, this is a really angry deer. And uh, he got a really powerful headache. <laughs> and I thought the side of my car is going to be destroyed because it made the loudest noise I've ever heard. But I think he must have turned broadside right before he hit me. And uh, it didn't damage my car at all. And somehow he ran off. So anyway, I thought I'm going to ride up here where there's some light and call the police and have them come do an accident report. But didn't have to. Uh, so I was just happy about that. But, James, I was the experienced guy. You know, we went to up to uh, Greenville, South Carolina a couple of years ago, and I was all worried about making sure, you know, that that experience was way shorter than this totality. It was more like a minute 30. And uh, I was more worried about making sure the kids had the clips glasses on and they didn't, you know, when they could take them off and when they had to put them back on. Here, this is, a, well, I have, to, I have to find this picture of me. It was just me because nobody else could come. Uh, some really cool people sat out behind the Hampton here with me. And uh, we got up on a little hill. And um, this is how dark it got during the actual totality. You know, it was pretty, pretty cool. Um, and then, but this was me. Like Jen, I had my music on, you know, Yes and and um, Grand Funk and things like that. It was just me, my Eclipse glasses, and just watching that thing for about two hours do its thing. But it was beautiful when, you know, it was fully covered. I swear I saw a solar flare on the Southern side of it. And maybe somebody will tell me that was a Bailey's bead or something, but I clearly saw an orange, um, you know, protrusion out of the bottom of the sun, you know, around the moon mm -hmm. the, for, for almost the entire time. And uh, the young man who was right in front of me was an astronomer from Nashville and he had driven up and had a big telescope and, his reaction when it went total was just spectacular. He just started yelling. He was so excited. And uh, they, you know, that got everybody around us kind of excited. But the thing that's been surprising to me, and maybe it was different in other places, nothing is crowded. I thought all the restaurants would be packed. You wouldn't be able to get in the convenience store. The roads would be backed up. It's been a, a dream up here. It was easy in, easy out. Everybody seems to be having a good time. and. You know, just just was kind of a fun day. Let's go to Dr. Neil Jacobs. Neil, where were you during the eclipse today? Um, honestly, not paying attention. I was. Uh, <laughs> I'm in I'm in Charleston right now uh, for the morning flood tides, but instead of doing any afternoon fishing, I actually went over to the uh, archery shop to to get a new bow. So I was hanging out at the archery shop when, uh, when the eclipse started. So I, I guess I could say I was doing target practice. I did, I did take, I did take one photo. Um, I don't know if you can see it, 
Uh, yeah. You, you can kind of see that it was only got to about 70% yeah. where, where I was. It. Um, no, but that, I, that's pretty clear. I mean, that was me using my phone and I kept getting glare. So I actually took some polarized sunglasses and held them over the camera lens before I, but that, I mean, like James said, I basically just walked around outside in the kind of half dark, which was creepy and weird, but <laughs> otherwise I was pretty entertaining. I was driving home to my mom's house from the shop and all along like the sides of the roads in town were people staring at the sun with no eye protection or anything. Oh saw, gosh. Oh my goodness. <laughs> like if you're if you're if you're just stream. I don't get oh. it. Like if you're tuned in enough to like some media source to know when the eclipse is, haven't you heard don't stare at it? I don't get and, it. And here's the other odd odd things today. There were some schools that did not allow their children to go outside on the playground. Why? Why? I mean, it's just, the, the the amount of disinformation is just really strange on this. And of course, the the, the fringe elements. Goodness, have you, have you seen the some of the social media things uh, that were supposed to happen today? Uh, one was five days of total darkness around the earth. Number two, <laughs> demons were going to be released. De demons were going to be released at the at the peak. They they started running this the the CERN thing, and, and demons were going to be released. Um, my, my, one of my favorites was that you were going to get hemorrhoids uh, at, the, at two o'clock today. <laughs> and uh, it, 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 and people believe this. I mean, it's just like uh, th there's some guy I actually know that bought two months worth of MREs uh, thinking that electricity would fail. Cell service would fail. All communications would fail. He would be in the dark, unable to buy food for at least two months. And he was he read that on Facebook uh, so now he's got two months of MREs, which may be in, you know, who knows? I mean, you know, I guess it's all right to have it, but goodness gracious, I don't understand <laughs> why people believe what they believe. So I, I was we have in, no get. Yeah, go ahead, Neil. Well, I, I was, I was, I went to the grocery store last night and they were, they were sold out of sunscreen. And <laughs> I understand like maybe people wanted sunscreen cause they were going to be out like all day, even though the eclipse is only like where I was, it was like 10 minutes, but they were like, oh no, you know, when, when, when you're having an eclipse, it's like the UV radiation is like super high. <laughs> like how does the oh. sun out put more shortwave radiation during eclipse than it normally does? Like, I don't understand the physics of that. <laughs> and it's covered up. Yeah. 95. Right. <laughs> I, uh, yeah. I, it's, yeah. It, it was odd what people believe but the, the next one is what i think there's one uh, one over a small part of the united states in 2044 then a longer path in the next year in 45 and uh bill i think that one comes across our state down here um alabama in 20 how old will you be in 2045 i will be 82 years old 82 uh i think i'll be 89 so um I, i'm i'm gonna keep these well, we got glasses for the next <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. So uh, again, we're, we're just going to go on random, uh, you know, subjects here. But I, Neil, if you don't, and I hate that I missed you. I mean, I, I was oh, crushed. I'm sorry, I missed you. Ke Ke Kevin and I went went to dinner Friday night, and we got comped. We got I a heard. free meal. I mean, he it's like you, <laughs> he told me you, you could have. You could have gotten a free meal. I mean, we, we were, I was just devastated. So I, I thought we would take a minute before we get into some other things here and kind of review uh, our talks. And I, I want to start with you because I had to come back right after my talk for a function up here. So tell us about, uh, well, number one, your experience there at USA and, and your, your talk on Sunday. What, what was it all about? Oh, it was awesome. Um, it was uh, actually, I've got a hilarious travel story on the way back about, a pilot and some tummy trouble. Um, oh. yeah, this show title, <laughs> show, show, show title. <laughs> this is, this story is per pretty entertaining. Um, so yeah, I, I was, it was, it was an awesome, this was like one of the most well-organized, perfectly orchestrated events I've ever spoken at. Like normally there's always like it issues, file issues. Like I, I sent them my talk ahead of time on a Google drive got there a little bit early. They uploaded it, played it perfect, fine, no issues. It was like 800 megabytes too, which was why I couldn't email it. Um, 
And so big shout out to everyone there. The the other thing is I had I had to get out. Like my my talk went from like eleven to twelve, and I had a, a like a two fifteen flight out of Pensacola. So I had to jump in the rental car and and take off because it was the only way I could get back to Charleston that same day was make that one flight. And they kept everyone right on time. Um, so my apologies for for folks who went over and got cut off for their Q and A. <laughs> hopefully, you get your questions answered later. Um, but I, I talked to you know I I had designed kind of a talk like real high level history of NWP and talking about like going back to like uh, you know Edward Lorentz and the limits of predictability and chaos theory and kind of weave my way into like probabilistic forecasting and game theory and risk assessment, which Kim's probably agitated that I was out there talking about how, you know, probabilities are hard to convey using examples from gambling. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the things that I got really inspired by was all the students there. And there was, there was a session before me on like, what to do and what not to do on on resumes and one of the things that they said is you know if you've worked at like mcdonald's or something like that put it on your resume and so i i just i took like the first 10 minutes of what i was going to launch into with nwp and just explained like i've interviewed a lot of people for positions even really high level positions and i love to see things like that on a resume because it always tells me this person does not think they're too good for a job, you know? And if you think that you like, you worked in like the fast food industry or you did like mowing lawns or whatever, keep that on there, you know? And so then I told him this story, like, I, I don't know that I ever mentioned it on, on this podcast before, but I actually started out at Ryan steakhouse working the fryer. Wow. Um, did I, did I did I not did I ever tell you this story about no, how I no, ended th up? Th th this, no, this th th this is this is news. T tell us. All right. So this. So I mean, some people know that I used to be a chef, but my career trajectory to becoming a chef is insane. So I, I started out at Ryan Steakhouse working the fryer, and then eventually worked my way up to the grill, and was doing. If you're not familiar with Ryan Steakhouse, it's like a upscale Golden Corral. Um, <laughs> if there's such a thing. <laughs> and so, you know, Charleston is like a hotbed for like, you know, culinary. There, there's like, there's so many restaurants per capita in this area. It doesn't even make any sense. But the reason why is there used to be a Johnson and Wales University in Charleston, which is like a cooking school. So anyway, I, I had had a lot of different jobs, uh, you know, cleaning fish, doing prep work, like before the actual real cooks got there. And so I show up at this restaurant in downtown Charleston. This is like before, you know, a couple hours before they even opened. And I was just looking for like a prep cook position, like someone to like cut stuff up or what, wash vegetables or clean fish. And so I knock on the door and they let me in. They're like, you must be the guy Johnson and Wales sent over. And I was like, uh... Yeah. What? <laughs> sure. And they're like, wow. "Where's your, uh, you know, where's your portfolio?" And I guess the the chefs have to have like a portfolio of recipes they've invented or something. I was like, oh, "I don't have it." So <laughs> I go, I go in the back of the kitchen, and there's this guy named Stanley. He's like, every time I tell the story, he gets bigger. But let's just say he was like six five, and he looks at me in like two seconds. He's like, "You don't know what you're doing." And I was like, I don't, I have no idea, but I will split my paycheck with you straight down the middle if you teach me every recipe in this place. And he's like, okay. <laughs> so he taught me how to cook everything on the menu and didn't tell anyone. And I gave him half my paycheck for like three or four months until I got proficient at actually cooking stuff. And then from then on in Charleston, it was just like, word of mouth name recognition like you would th there's this festival there in the spring called spoleto and during spoleto a lot of the chefs at the different restaurants guest chef at other restaurants so i got to guest chef at a couple different restaurants and the owners got to know me no one ever asked 
like where you went to school or you know whatever and so they would always be like whenever i'd go to a new restaurant they'd be like well who'd you work for before they'd call the owner and he'd be like oh yeah he knows what he's doing and so that's how i ended up being a cook and um i was actually wiring shrimp boats in the daytime and cooking at night and the company that I was working with got the contract to wire this NOAA vessel called the Ron Brown, which was stationed in Charleston. They bought it in like 1995, I think. And I was one of the people doing some of the original wiring on the Ron Brown. And one of the PIs for the first field experiment of that ship was from NC State. And he comes down. This is Lynn Piatrafeza, uh, who used to be the chair of the NOAA Science Advisory Board. He comes down and starts talking to me. He's like, you should go to grad school. And I thought, why? I'm having fun down here, basically doing nothing but wiring boats, cooking, and fishing. He's like, you're grad school material. You should come. I'm the department head. I got money. And uh, so I go up to NC State, going off on a little bit of a tangent here, but I'll wrap this story up on a second because it's totally hilarious. So I go to NC State to visit the department and I go into his office, he's on the phone and he's like, Oh, Oh, I got a prospective student here. I'll, I'm going to, I'll, I'll get back with you. And he hangs up the phone and he's, he, and he looks at me, he's like, I'm so glad you're here. I, you know, Oh, that was Al Gore on the phone. <laughs> and, and I was wow. like, I was like, wow. you just, this is just like, you just hung up on the vice president to give me like a tour. <laughs> wow. I guess I'm coming so, so here now. How, how how old were you when this happened? Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, probably early 20s. I wow. mean, yeah. I mean, I was, I, I got, I, I took a, like an extra year in undergrad because I was just goofing off too much. And then I took a year off um, and goofed around down in Central America and then was in Charleston, just, I don't know, having fun. So, by but, the way, Wiring boats, cooking and fishing is the new show title. Is, is at this moment. I mean, it it, it, gets, it gets no. I, I we've never. I've not heard that story before. And and you're yeah, right. So, so, I think so, it's so. Doctor Jacobs, if you want to pick up a few hours behind the line in D.C. when you're up there, a couple of nights, I got a fine dining restaurant. I could put you in the kitchen. All. I I still I I believe it or not. I I I love cooking for people. Um, I, I it, it was. It was pretty funny. So when I was at NOAA, the uh, um, some of the forecasters and the folks out in Guam like sent me a care package, and they were like, "This is like an Iron Chef challenge," and they sent me like macadamia nuts, like two cans of different flavored spam, and some of this insane hot sauce. And they were like, "You got to cook something with all this stuff." So I, I, ended, I ended up, I ended up making uh, spam California rolls, and then. Um, basically sauteed the macadamia nuts in the hot sauce and then made, you know, this other thing, this other dish with some of the spam and, and fried eggs. It was, it was pretty fun. So, wow. so James, I hijacked your profound direction you were going there because I had to ask Dr. Jake if I could get him behind the line there sometime in DC, but go ahead and say what you were going to say that was profound. No, 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 no. It's, uh, it's, it's not profound at all. I, I just, you know, it, I think that it's encouraging to see where people, where they came from. We we all started somewhere, you know, and, and mm -hmm. it's funny how some people are just afraid to put that down in the resume that they worked, you know, wiring boats or worked they at are. McDonald's. <laughs> I don't know why, why would they do that. Why? I, I why? guess they're embarrassed by it. They think it's low level, but like I, I told them, I was like, keep that stuff on your resume. Like I've got a commercial driver's license. I drove an 18 wheeler flatbed for a while. And I still have that on my resume because I just thought if all else fails, I could still drive a truck. I mean, they make decent <laughs> money and they don't have to deal with people, which is, you know, kind of nice. Um, but, you know, I think the most important thing that my message to these students was this shows that you have work ethic, that you're, you're you know, you've got humility. The thing that irritates me more than anything are these are these kids these days who are like, oh, I'm too good for that job. That job's below me or whatever. I'm like, you know, you've had everything given to you. You actually, you need to go do some manual labor for minimum wage, you know, and, and learn how to appreciate what, what you get in life. 
I, I told them one of my secrets. If I interview somebody, I will get a Rice Krispie treat uh, with, with you know, the, the one that's wrapped up, the, a big one. And if you've ever had one of those, it's bright blue or purple, the wrapper. And I will put the wrapper on the floor right by a trash can to see if that candidate, when he comes into the office, will pick up that Rice Krispie treat wrapper and put it in the trash can. And it's shocking how many of them won't do that. And I, again, that's not how you get the job, but it just, it's like the resume thing. It just says something about the fact that, you know, you, you, you think you're too good to pick up trash. I mean, good. And I pick up trash all the time. I'd be a great trash guy. I mean, I'd clean bathrooms. It doesn't matter to me. My, uh, and I think that is a, a good thing. And, and John, John Gordon was there, Neil. I don't know if you know John that well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, he was in Louisville. He was the one doing a lot of this stuff with with the students. So that's kind of what inspired me to tweak my talk a little bit. Yeah, he gave a talk Saturday and a lot of it was geared toward those students. And I think he scared him half to death. John is like me. He roams. <laughs> I mean, he'll get out there and he talks really loud. He'll get his finger in your face and he's roaming around. But, uh, you know, he, he talked about what he looks for when he's hiring. And, and he discussed the number of colleges now that offer meteorology compared to what it used to be 20 years ago. And, you know, there's a lot and you've got a lot of candidates applying for, you know, a small number of jobs here. And he talked about ways in which you can gain an advantage. And his talk was very good. And I, I think it's great that, that they heard John and they heard you because so many in that room were students and they're going to be needing a job soon. In fact, on the way out, all the seniors wanted to take their picture with me. And I said, all right, guys, uh, you know, you're about out soon and I'm good for nothing, but I know people. So if you need some help, let me know. And, and, but I, I do like this generation. I, I think they, I think they do like to work hard. I, I think they like to innovate and, and especially for people that do what I do for a living, this practitioner thing, you know, for years and years, it was broadcast meteorology. And we all know that's going away. These Ron Burgundy newscasts won't last much longer. Jen, when's the last time you watched a Ron Burgundy newscast? You know, Action News yeah. tonight at 10. It, it's been a while. Um, maybe, well, during severe weather here. You know, that's the only time. Well, that, I don't that, watch, that does, that does, yeah. severe weather coverage doesn't, doesn't count. count. I'm talking yeah, just a regular just newscast. Regular news? Uh, years. It's 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 not relevant to people because what they do that they're going to get the news that they're interested in on their phone or their mm -hmm. tablet or whatever, and you know it's often based on their interests or maybe their political worldview, whatever. And, and you know the concept of what we've done in these newscasts it's broken, and I hate that. It, it, you know it's it's provided a great living for me and my family over the years, but it's time to move on from that. And, and these kids need to understand that. I think something better will come from all of this, but there's going to be some pain during the transformation. And, uh, but I think they will reinvent the wheel, but, um, and, and so, so here's the real quickly, uh, what, what I talked about, uh, my talk was to be a case study and I love case studies where you take a severe weather event and you go back and you dissect it, you deconstruct the event, you deconstruct the science, the setup what went right, what went wrong in the forecasting and the messaging and the warning process and the end result and what we learned. I love case studies. In fact, when I go to these conferences, I go really to hear some of these case studies. And my case study happened to be on March 25th, 2021. Bill, remember that one? Not March 25th. So uh, is that, that was your, the day is that house. your event where it hit your house? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's an interesting day. We, 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 we had six long track upper end EF threes on that day, not fours or fives, but upper end threes. And they were long track. These were, you know, these were pretty tough and uh, we had six fatalities, but as I sometimes do, and, and I'm typically unhinged now, and Neil, I would agree with you. They were very organized and I, I'm an outlier when I come into these things, uh, I use my own computer. I just don't trust you know, PowerPoint and I just can't, you know, Google slides, whatever. I just can't do it because I use so much video. In fact, my file was five gigs, five gigs. And, wow. Uh, so I know. I don't feel bad now. I mean, I brought yeah, my yeah. own computer, but <laughs> it worked fine on theirs, but five gigs. Wow. You weren't emailing yeah. that. <laughs> no, no, no. Email's not going to work. And, and, um, for what I did and, and for using so much video, 
a keynote, which is Apple's version of PowerPoint, is just better geared for a lot of video. And I'm used to it. I use that every day. And they were very kind. And instead of saying, no, man, you can't do that. Uh, we went over there and uh, I just plugged an HDMI cable straight into the wall that went to that projector and they let me have it. And when I was through, they just plugged theirs right back in. So they were very kind and it was very, you're right. It was very well organized and it was just, it was a good, good conference. And uh, it, it, I, I saw a lot of good old friends there and met a lot of new friends, but I interrupted my talk, <laughs> which sometimes I do and my burden right now. And, and I know we're going to do a show on this soon. I think Bill is the fact that in my humble opinion, we have a warning addiction process in this country. And it's and it's moved over from the social media outliers to the main weather enterprise. And I honestly believe we're going to scare people until we kill them. I believe that in all my heart. My job is to mitigate loss of life during tornadoes. When tornadoes are flying around here, I'm standing on that green wall, messaging people on what to do. And something has changed. Something has changed in the culture. And I don't know what it is. The, the same people are basically at these national centers and a lot of the forecast offices. But it just seems like within the last one year, just the last 12 months, the false alarm ratio is really ramped up in a big way locally and nationally. And I'm noticing it. I'm noticing it in, in the people we serve. And here's the problem. I honestly think there is a disconnect now between the weather enterprise and the people we serve. And I wish Kim was on the show because if she was on the show, I would say, prove me wrong because she, she has quantitative data here where I, I'm, I'm based what I'm saying on talking with people. And here's the way I do things. When I go speak in a school, and by the way, I'm in one, two or three schools a day not a month, a day. Tomorrow, I'm going to Athens, Alabama. I'm going to see the kids at Athens Elementary. And then after Athens, let's see, I'll be at um, Piney Chapel Elementary. Both of these are in Limestone County, which is not in my TV market. Markets don't mean anything anymore, but it's near the Tennessee state line. But on the way to these schools, you know what I like to do, guys? What do I like to do? Stop in Dollar General's. And Walmarts, where real people are. These are not weather, you know, professionals at a conference. These are not weather enthusiasts or dweebs. These are just the people we serve. And I talk with them and I like to listen to them. And I've heard it more in the last six months and I've heard it in a long time. I hear this stuff all the time and nothing ever happens. Nothing, nothing. And they're getting sick of it. They're being overworn. Some weather service offices, their false alarm ratio is knocking on 90. 90% 90 of tornado warnings are false alarms. Are we that bad? If we're that bad, we need to move on and find some new people here. And, you know, I, I just don't understand it. And I wonder what it is, what has changed. And again, we cannot control the YouTube TikTok guys. And I'm not saying they're all bad. I'm not. We need to learn from some of them in terms of how to reach people. Some of what they do is good. They learn how to reach people. In fact, a lot of the TikTokers and YouTubers have a lot more audience than any of us, Jen, in broadcasting. A lot more. It's not even close. But th there's a lot of bad actors. Some of that stuff's just garbage. You know, everything's a tornado outbreak two weeks in advance. Deadly killer tornado outbreak in the Deep South coming up in 10 to 15 days. Uh, subscribe here. Ring the bells. So, and, and, you know, that scares people. We can't control that. There's nothing we can do to control that. That horse is out of the barn and it's not coming back in. But by golly, we can control some things in the weather enterprise, like a 90 false alarm ratio or an even an 80 or a 70. That's not acceptable. And if you think that's acceptable, why in the world do you think that? And it's worn, 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 worn. Everything is dangerous. Everything is horrible. Everything. And, and people are numb to it. They're just sick of it. And I'm just in a band. And sometimes I feel like a lone voice crying out in the wilderness here. And we've got to do something to get that FAR down on a national level and on a local level. And, and you know, I probably he owed somebody in that thing. And, and that's OK. At my age, I don't care. I'm look, I've been doing this a long time and it is my job to serve the people, not the weather enterprise, but the people. And if I, you know, 
I, I'm hoping just somebody heard that and I'm still looking for answers in terms of what changed. Why is the FAR so high? Do, do y'all have any idea? I mean, I, I don't, I don't know. It's different okay. now. I was going to ask you your thoughts. Why do you think, what do you think changed a year ago? Was there an event that triggered this or I, I, I don't know? I, I don't, I, 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 so I think some of it's fear of getting in trouble of missing one. And we're not that we, we cannot warn for every tornado that's down for 90 seconds in a QLCS at 2 a.m. You can't do that. If you do that, you'll be issuing warnings all day that are false. And I, maybe I, I don't know this fear of being reprimanded for missing a tornado. If it's fear of the POD coming down, um, I, I, I don't worry know it's if it's social media. I mean, I yeah. don't I don't think that there's any pressure from weather service leadership on this front, but I feel like a lot of forecasters are, you know, worried about getting attacked on social media by all the, you know, the knuckleheads who, you know, they, it's heads, I win, tails, you lose kind of game. And I mean, that, that whole world's toxic and you know that they read that stuff. Like, why didn't you issue a warning? You know, there was a tornado and eventually, even if it's subconscious, it probably builds up in your mind. I mean, Kevin. Kevin gave an unbelievable talk. Um, yeah, the, kind of uh, describe because I, I hate that I missed it. Kind of get, give the summary of what he had to say. I mean, he was basically talking about how, other than just straight looking at like you know velocity couplets on radar, that you could use other tools, you know, like LCL and other stuff, depending on where you were and knowing the local environment and and which sort of driving factors in the environment really you know, had uh, contributed to tornado genesis in your particular region and not to jump the gun on stuff. And the statistics that he showed out of, out of the Birmingham office were, were mind blowing, you know, like their rate. Dr. Jacobs, why did that not catch on nationally? Because obviously Kevin and them started this about 10, 12 years ago. Yeah. It's had time to catch on. Why hasn't it propagated to other weather offices? I don't know. I mean, I, I think that there's there's probably risk aversion for sort of getting out of your swim lane. Like, I mean, you saw this with Slack, right? Like everyone had been using Slack for years, but then once word got out, everyone got their hand slapped. Um, so I think there's a tendency to just sort of keep your head down and do your job to the best you can and you know, I feel like there's there's probably, you know, I think they're maybe they're they're in an interesting situation with with Ken Graham, you know, who used to work in the field, having sort of a better reach into the field and and some of these ideas bubble up because there have been things that that bubble up from the forecast offices, um, you know, but I don't necessarily know that his his method would work you know, like in the planes or, or whatever it's there. But I think it, as long as you know, like what are the sort of the driving factors for your area, it's pretty helpful. I, this is another argument for, yeah, I mean, there, there are pros and cons for forecasters bounce around in different offices. And, and one of, one of the, the pros was, oh, they get a lot of experience forecasting different type of weather phenomenon. But the downside is if you get really good and you've been forecasting weather in a certain area, you can just like walk outside and kind of sniff the air and be like, yep, I know what's going to happen. <laughs> and you, I don't know how to teach that, but it's, it's a thing, you know, and these forecasters who've been forecasting in the same region for 20, 30 years, they rarely miss it. Like, like the new people. And I think it would be good if the new people come into the office have those people as mentors and they stay in those areas and they're not necessarily like, Oh, now I'm going to go do nor'easters. And then, you know, two years from now, I'm going to do, you know, snowpack in the, in the Pacific Northwest or whatever. It's, it's always something different, but I think, I think, I think someone needs to give Kevin a bigger platform uh, mm -hmm. to, to talk up to same to show that same PowerPoint that he showed. Cause it blew my mind. I had never seen it before. And I wish someone would show that to me a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, we've been yeah, seeing I, it for 10 or 12 years, James. It makes a difference when the storm's oh, moving. Let me, let me tell you what. 
I will tell you, it is such a comfort knowing the way the office here works where, and again, I, I, this is no criticism of any people or specific offices. I'm, I'm criticizing all of us, but I will, we, we need to recognize that Birmingham has done an amazing job, but I will tell you guys, there's some bizarre criticism of Birmingham from those within the NOAA national weather service organization in high levels that don't like what they're doing. And I don't understand that. Uh, right. To me, if you've got a high POD and a low FAR, by golly, you're doing your job. Um, and, and, and they the, were right the, the on top of these storms the other night, the one, the four tornadoes that happened across central Alabama, you know, the, those ingredients just came together over a very small area. And, right. I mean, and they look, were that, that, on the spot. That, last, last week, POD 100, FAR 0. The perfect. And you, you can't do any better than that. And they held their finger off that Warren Gin button uh, time and time again, where in some other places it's Warren, Warren, Warren. And it forces us on television when there's nothing going on and people are sick of it. And that that's the thing. If, if only forecasters, these meteorologists and the weather service offices can get out and go into, I wish they could come with me, come to the Dollar General in Georgiana, east of Boga. Andalusia, Alexandria, come, come with me and li don't listen to me. I'm just a bag of hot air. Who gives a red rip? What I say, listen to what our people say, the people that we serve. And that's where I've just worried that we've lost touch with them. And I, I, I mainly tried to set Kevin up, Neil. That's, that's, that's the, the, the point of my interruption was to remind everybody, I want you in this room at 8.15 tomorrow morning. Don't be late. Don't be looking at your phone. Don't check the tweeter. Don't check any of this stuff. You're going to focus on what this guy's going to got to no, say. It was, it was packed. Good, it was good, packed. good, good. Because I was worried that he had that early slot, you know, 8.15 on a Sunday. But but that's encouraging and. And again, it, it, it makes it hard on us. I don't think everybody stops to think about what we do. The, the practitioner level, you got a different culture at every weather service office. It's different. And I'm not saying it's all good or bad, but some offices are just aggressive. They'll warn if a dog farts. And, and then <laughs> you've got conservative offices that do like Birmingham and in, in where the boundaries come together, you know, people say, well, there's a warning here. We're about to have a warning here. Well, no, you're not. And I just wish there was better coordination and just better with these adjoining offices, the ones that are adjacent to each other in, in it. So I'm just trying to start a process and I don't want to be critical. You, nobody wants a griper whining, moaning, griping rants. That's fine. If you need to air it out, you know, like we're doing here, but that doesn't offer a solution. I want to be part of a solution. And I think part of it, it's simple communication. And uh, where these offices have a different culture, I hope that there's not this standoffish kind of thing going on here. But anyway, that that's, you know, that was my program interruption. But in my talk, and I know we got to move on here because you all have other things to say. Uh, of those that died, April, March 25th, 2021, where were they when they died? Mobile homes. Mobile homes. And so that's one of our biggest challenges here. It's people that live in manufactured housing. And, you know, I know everybody that was in St. Louis for that famous NWA meeting, whenever it was, when I, <laughs> Bill, were you there for that one? When uh, <laughs> I, uh, I did know, get to sit in the room, but I, I saw the people. Um, it, with so so with some, some, somehow <laughs> I, 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 MHI, you know, the M Manufactured Housing Institute, their lobby had like a 45 minute session and, and they basically, and, 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 you know, everybody in the room, there were 500 people in there and they were all looking at me because they knew I'm the guy <laughs> that's going to stand up and say something to these people. And, and they were trying to get us to say on television that mobile homes are just as safe as a site built home during a tornado outbreak. And, and, and I finally said, let, let me review this. Let me be sure I understand what you're wanting us to do. You're wanting us to say that a mobile home is just as safe as a site built home during a tornado. And they said, yes. And I just finally, I, I the, the quote was, I said, stop the mumbo jumbo, just stop it. 
If you want me to say that, you got the wrong guy. And at the same time, I said to you, I'm your best friend. Manufactured housing has offered people an amazing, wonderful, affordable place to live. It has changed lives in a positive way. I have worked many, many ministries in low-income communities, and manufactured homes will come in there, and it gives people a great lifestyle. I'm your biggest supporter. You know, don't come after me here. But I'm going to come after you for this message because cars are great. When I leave work here after this shift, I'm going to hop in a car and drive home. If I had to walk, no telling how long I'd be there, you know, after midnight, but driving, I'm there in 10, 15 minutes. Cars are great. Mobile homes are great, but they're both death traps during a tornado. And we, we're not doing, in my opinion, an adequate job in the weather enterprise of helping them. And as I see more and more of this, it really just crawls up my rear end. I see a lot of people in the weather enterprise being condescending to people that live in trailers, basically telling you it's your fault. It's your fault that you're in danger because you live in a trailer. It's not my fault. It's your fault. Well, here's an idea. Maybe it is our fault because we're not doing an adequate job to help them to get to a safe place. The average lead time in Birmingham is about 12 minutes for a tornado warning. For a lot of folks that live in trailers, and by the way, most people that live in manufactured housing, they call them trailers. I'm speaking their language. For most people that live in trailers, it takes them 15 to 30 minutes to get to a shelter or a business that's open 24-7. So the warning lead time isn't adequate in most cases. And I just think there's got to be a way for us to coordinate some message, and it doesn't have to be a formal message, but we can do this on Slack. We're all there. All the big loudmouths that are doing tornado coverage, we can just coordinate and we have to do it on the same, we have to say the same thing. But if you live in a mobile home, if, if you're in uh, Cullman or Holly Pond or Berlin or Wealthy uh, or Joppa, if you live in a mobile home, you need to go to your shelter now. There's no formal warning yet, but you need to go to your shelter now. They'll sit there for an hour. You can't, and, and some guy said, well, they should go to the shelter when there's a tornado watch. Come on. You're expecting somebody to sit in one of these community tornado shelters for six hours? Have you guys ever been in one of these things? They, they, they smell horrible. There's weird people in there. You got animals that are pooping. It, it's not a pleasant place. And to expect somebody to sit there for six hours is not realistic. But they'll sit there for one hour. They will. And so we just have to do better. And that's my challenge to the weather enterprise is to what can we do to help them? And, and where we are down here, Bill, our percentage of those that live in manufactured housing, I think it's a lot higher than you know, right. Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska. You look at Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, the, the, the you know, southern U.S. tornado zone down here. We have a very dense population and uh, we, we've got to do better. And so I, I think that we can on Slack all agree on a time to pull the trigger and say, if you live in a mobile home here, 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 go to a safe place. And that's why I wish Kim was on the show. And, and maybe we can talk about it later, Bill. But that, that, that was yeah, my yeah, rant at the uh, symposium is that we've got to do better. Um, Jen, what do you think? Any, any thoughts on mobile home residents? How can we do better for them? No, I think you're right. And I think it's just... It is our messaging and it's it's being inclusive in our wording and it's not talking down and it's it's I there's nothing wrong with us giving the heads up ahead of the warning. You know, start the messaging when the watch comes out and to, it's giving the heads up. That's what the watch is for, is giving that heads up. And then as the, as time goes on and we see how things are unfolding, but it's also building the trust with people. And I think that's the battle because we are starting to lose the trust because there are so many, there's so much noise. There is the social media aspect of, of some of these people that drown out the, the James fans of the world, you know, the, the voices that, that we can trust. And that is, has the pulse of the communities. And then we've got people who want to just do the fear. And, you know, we had the event um, up at uh, Indian Lake up here and the next week, there was a potential for severe weather. And a friend of mine sent me a Facebook message. She goes, is this true? Could this happen? It was some person. And 
you know, Bruce saying tick, 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 you know, almost like a ticking bomb, you know, on the post. And I about came out of my seat. I'm like, that is irresponsible. A lot of the folks who live on Indian Lake didn't, they were uh, more like manufactured homes, you know, right along the lake and they lost everything. And you can't do that. Those folks had just lost everything and the PTSD was so high. And then we had on April 2nd, things were happening again. And it's 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 trying to, to get the message through all the noise. And I think that's the hard part too. And people get weary. And we definitely have the fatigue up here. And I, I saw the outlook this week. I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> There's more, you know, more storms this week and, you know, a hi highlighted threat for Thursday already up here. And it's how do you get that message out to folks? And it, it's very difficult, James. And I, I don't have that pressure that you have on radio i i can only say so much in 20 seconds or 30 seconds and sometimes it hurts my heart that i can't say more but that's all i'm given and so i do my best to try to just let people know what i know and to be weather aware and to make sure they have those weather radios and i think it's just we need to try to find the best ways to educate people to the best of our ability but also too what what is, does it look like for shelters? Are there enough shelters for people to go to? And I think that's there's, and that's 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 a case as well. And I, I know that there are some folks who are out there who have uh, tools and mapping of of you know, and trying to let people know where are the shelters. So we have to educate more, and you know, that's our responsibility as a weather enterprise to do it. And the other big problem is that a lot of people don't have transportation. Yeah that live in manufactured housing. So you, even if we coordinate a message between all the entities, you know, that, that, that are serving the people that are communicating, we're the, we're the blowtorch, the bullhorn. Well, what if they hear the message and they, they don't have a car that starts, they, they don't have a car at all. And they, they don't have anybody to give them a ride. It's a very complex problem. Neil, you're the smartest person in the room here. What, what do you do here? Help us out. I, I don't know. I mean, I've been struggling with with ways to to you know try to figure out how to solve this. I mean, as much as I love forecasting, I think the amount of money that would have to get invested to get the lead time to a point where they could act is is almost a pipe dream. Like I, I think a, a quicker return on investment would be a shelter program. Like I, I just I don't understand. Like the amount of money that they spend paving roads everywhere in the middle of nowhere you would think that a fraction of that could go to you know at least subsidized or maybe completely funded shelter building program um but the problem is politically like how do you is that a voting issue like everyone gets pissed off when they're hitting potholes on the roads and everyone and if you went out there and we're like i'm gonna build shelters and you most likely will never ever use this in your lifetime but if you need to you'll be glad it's there most people are are not going to see that as like a voting issue because the people who wish it was a voting issue might not be here to vote i mean that's yeah. that's the reality is it's it's a catastrophic, tragic outcome for a relatively small number of people um, who actually need it. And so it's it's preventative investment is like one of the hardest things I've ever tried to get government to do, because it's so easy after a major disaster to be a representative or, or like if you're on the appropriations committee and you're like, look how much money I got for my district to recover from this disaster. And I would always think like, well, you know, maybe for a tenth of that, you could have prevented or mitigated some of that. Why didn't you invest on preventative on the front end? And you, and it's, 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 Hundred percent. Every single one comes back to me, and they're like, "Well, everyone, it's it's a message that resonates with voters that I got them money after the event. But if I invested their taxpayer money and told them, hey, you know that thing that I bought for you that never happened, it worked.' <laughs> yeah, they're they're yeah, going to be uh, like, it, what? It, it is a problem. Know, our, our friend Chandler Wallace, you know, wants to you know to put shelters in communities and raise money, you know through projects that he does. And I think that's great, but 
James, you know, especially in Alabama, it looks like it's an opportunity for our churches. You know, that, that may be an outreach that we're, we're kind of overlooking in our communities. And it concerns me as our country becomes less churched, um, we're losing this element of community um, that exists there. And so maybe it's, you know, an opportunity for our church leaders to, you know, start reaching out to those folks because this is where the rubber meets the road. You know, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of poverty and a lot of other issues too, but, you know, we've got churches all over Alabama and, you know, Tornado Alley that, um, you know, could, could put a little organized effort together on something like that. What, what do you think about that, James? Is that, too big of a task to take home in that environment or is that a possibility no not not really and, and i'll be honest with you Here, here's an easy start how about if the churches open up as a shelter okay mm, exactly you, you, down here in the deep south we got churches on most every corner and they are in very right. rural areas and in and, and if they are willing of course not every church can serve as a shelter because the structure is not qualified right, to serve not as a shelter. Safe. but right but a lot of them are and if they could just number one open up their, you know, their basement or or a safe place in there, just an interior hall in the center of the building, if if it's a decent structure, that's a start. Mm -hmm. uh, so th that and that's the kind of thing I think we have to look at. It's just where can we start? And here's the other thing I think we should do. I believe with every trailer sold in this state, and Mississippi, and Tennessee, and Georgia, and Arkansas, and Oklahoma, and really everywhere in the, in a tornado prone area. A weather radio needs to come with it. Mm -hmm. And I know that, you know, Bruce Jones time is coming here, but and he did not pay me to say this, but they, they often don't get the warning. And now with the consumer habits changing, po folks don't go home and watch CBS tonight at eight o'clock, eight o'clock central, nine o'clock Eastern. They, no, they're going to watch Netflix or YouTube or Hulu or Amazon prime. And, um, you know, they, they just, they might not be aware of the warning. So maybe a start. And, it's and just Nate, getting Nate Johnson sent me something interesting, James. Um, somebody was in Kansas and their cable in their Hampton Inn showed them a warning um, for Dallas. And I was trying to figure out, you know, with Nate, how in the world that happened. You know, with, I think that the hotel subscribed to charter for their, you know, free to guest television, uh, you know, and, and was the head end in Kansas just programmed with the wrong county, you know, or, or you know, is that some feed that comes out of Dallas? You know, we, we didn't resolve it, but he was going to do some more looking into it. But, you know, stuff like that's kind of important uh, for a hotel. Yeah, and, and of course, because the guests you know, don't know where they are. You know, well, and and I, and I, oh, if I could real quick, I want to mention um, I was asking if we'd ever had Craig Cece on the show. Um, we have not. Jen. OK, I know who you're you know who that about. is He's that from Mississippi good. State. Yeah, he yeah. Um, he has uh, find your tornado shelter LLC and it's an initiative. And I've seen him post a lot more lately with maps of he has his, the maps of where tornado shelters are. And so um, I think that those type of initiatives are amazing and i would like to learn more from him um mm -hmm. about what he does and and how do we get the word out on stuff like that more and so people can find it and be able to see it on an app where is it you know or what if you're visiting someplace and you don't know where you know where there's a shelter um you know it's it just I, stuff like that is is important and so i, I like his initiative well, we, we were typing letters to the guests last Tuesday night. We have a brand new Hampton Inn in Bessemer, James. And, you know, Tina was typing out the letters and she said, which station is James Spann on? Uh, so <laughs> he's, on he's, he's on channel 27 on this, on this television. <laughs> wow. Well, again, and that's just my, my, that's my heart. And that's what drives me. You know, a lot of people say, how come you don't retire? Cause Tom Skilling's retired. I'm, I'm the last <laughs> of this generation. I am the last guy, you know, Gary England's gone. Skilling is gone. I don't think there's anybody in my generation left except me. And people say, why do you still do this? Well, number one, I love to come to work every day. 
Number two, I feel good, man. I feel better now than I felt when I was Neil's age. I feel good. My cognition is good. I cannot wait to come to work every day. And we've got work to do. And, you know, that's the thing. If I, if I quit now, there's, there's too much work to do. All these people are losing their lives when the physical science is so good. You know, we, we've got to work on the social science side of this and the these, you know, behavioral science problems. And we just got work to do. And I just can't stop. I, I don't know how to stop. So that's you, not going to happen ever anytime stop, soon. James. You're going to, when we do the eclipse and. 2025 you'll still be you'll still be cranking along <laughs> yeah and i was going to say real quick um you know the, we're we're in the season now where every day there's a big tornado anniversary but and i know today the eclipse was the big deal but goodness bill i think back on april 8th 1998 mm. we had an f5 come through the birmingham metro and that put this little operation on the map uh, because we were pretty aggressive back then where everybody else was still kind of timid about doing wall-to-wall -wall tornado coverage. But 32 people died in places like Oak Grove, Rock Creek, Sylvan Springs, McDonald Chapel, Pratt City, Edgewater. And most of you don't know where these places are, but they're just west and north of Birmingham. And th understand, this was a five. When's the last time we had a five? What was it, El Reno, uh, 2013? Is that the last five? in mm -hmm. the country mm -hmm. yeah. uh they, they don't happen a lot and goodness gracious these things are incredible monsters more it was more oh more okay yeah uh yeah well, I, I knew some of our folks listening would know that but but anyway the the you know i look back on it and i don't know warnings just meant something back then that where now they're a dime a dozen if you want to hear something funny let, let me play this real quick i know bruce is on here uh, I, I want to, and I've played this on here before. I want to go back to Weather Brains One. Okay, this is episode nine hundred fifty-one. We have done nine hundred fifty-one episodes, but I want to go back to episode one, Weather Brains One. This was the show on January thirty-first, two thousand six. Okay, and I'm just going to roll the open and listen to what I was griping about in two thousand six. I personally think we have way too many warnings. Severe thunderstorm warnings are a dime a dozen, and it's getting to be that way with tornado warning. Welcome. Uh-huh. So <laughs> <laughs> nothing has changed. Uh, oh, man. You know, and um, I, I just, uh, and, and I think there was a time where the FAR got down lower, but it's just rising again. And uh, between the mobile homes and the constant hyperbole, and again, we cannot control what they see on YouTube and Facebook. I, the, the, the amount of idiocy over there, goodness gracious, it, it's just insane. Um, and, and I'll chase one more rabbit and we'll bring in Bruce. Uh, I, I don't know what it is, but the chemtrail and the flat earthers have gotten yeah. bad. Do, do they ever get on you? Anybody on the show? Does they ever come after you guys? Well, I, I happened to be driving back to the airport in D.C. with uh, one of my associates. And he looked over and he said, he said, Mr. Murray, do you believe in chemtrails? And it's like he triggered me, you know, so I start griping for the next four or five minutes. And he goes, well, my dad believes they're real. <laughs> and I was like, oops, <laughs> I'd kind of stepped in it there. But, uh, you know, this morning when I looked out and there were tons of contrails here, you know, I just had to laugh because I, I, I was talking to my business partner. I'm like, yeah, we're not going to be able to see the eclipse today for all the chemtrails so could y'all turn off the chemtrails for a couple hours and sure enough they all went away so oh, you, the, how do you know that wasn't the, uh, that might have been the gov <laughs> government protecting the people from looking at the eclipse directly that that must be what it was but they must have heard me <laughs> complaining dr jacobs because they went away but you know i knew the moisture just moved away the upper level moisture and the plane stopped producing the chemtrails. It's just magical. How that now, I want you to know that I, I I have in my possession the switch right here. So I can, I can turn it on anytime I want to. All right. Uh, I need one of those, this, if you don't mind, the, so I could send it to my associate. <laughs> um, but the, their, their thing, apparently they have like a chemtrail action team. And, and what triggered it yesterday, I posted an image of a contrailed shadow. There was a ca shadow cast on a bunch of haze, which was fairly common. It's, it's not that odd. But boy, they, they were triggered. I mean, they were triggered. And they come after you from all over the country in mass. And not only do they come in the comments section, 
but they will come after you with private threats. They will list your wife's name, your children's name, your address. We know where you live. You continue to lie. You'll be in grave danger. This is the kind of stuff I get. And, and it's gone from just being funny to being these, these threats. And, and I have to turn them into law enforcement by nature of my employment agreement with my employer here. And uh, if you're a chemtrail or a flat earth person, can you give us a day off like today? I was hoping they would, but they they don't. Uh, How about tomorrow, Dave? <laughs> Today's already I mean, pretty much gone. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. It, oh it's, man, I I, I, I don't miss don't. those days. Like when I worked at Noah, I used to get a thousand emails a day with crazy stuff, and it was like, then yeah, then it just magically stopped. I'm sure, Doctor <laughs> Spinrad's getting them all now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh on that oh. note let's bring in bruce uh jones uh bruce i'm sorry you had to be exposed no. to this how you doing i love it i'm telling you if you post cirrus clouds <laughs> or any image where there's one condensation trail the, the, <laughs> the, the, it's the, they're poisoning our families <laughs> and i'm a liar and here's the here's the claim and this is all public. You go to this post yesterday, go to my face bag page and, and look at the post yesterday with the uh, contrail shadows. And, and one guy, he says that I'm being paid uh, to lie. So where's the check? Where's the check? I mean, wh where's who's who's paying? Where's it yeah. coming? When, when does the check arrive? I mean, it's like, uh, you know, it's 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 just bizarre and and i really do think there's a mental health crisis in this country and some of these people do have some type of disorder and it's not good and so well uh, apparently and, ryan hall stepped in it last week with the chemtrails people and he must have been pretty naive about it because i saw his initial comment was Surely these are jokes in my comment section. Oh, uh, no. He said it's oh, either boy. that or we have a real mental health crisis in America. <laughs> wow, man. Ryan Hall versus the chemtrail committee. I, I want to see that. Boy, that that is a very interesting uh, uh, standoff there. Uh, but he, I, let, let me just read. I promise, Bruce, we're going to get. Let me read one. This is one of the private messages. Most of them are profanity filled, and I can't read them. Sir, it has been brought to my attention that you are miseducating people. Every single meteorologist in the world knows the difference between geoengineering and God's clouds. So why are y'all accepting this? To keep your job? Isn't there some way for you to rebel against these chemicals hurting your own family? And I know that you aren't responsible. The Air Force is. But that's no excuse to cover for their behavior. Hmm. And I get just dozens of these things. And um, people will believe almost anything. There were people, I'm telling you, there are people today. And I told you about the guy that stocked up on MREs for two months because he thought there'd be no cell service, no electricity, no water, that, that all civil services would break down today. And they, they believe this stuff. So it's. I was more worried about what, there wouldn't be any Bebo's at the at the come and go when I got here, you know, but that was all I was really worried about. <laughs> yeah. And then, then of course we have the, the, the hemorrhoids that never happened that, that I still can't figure out why well, we're going to get hemorrhoids from happen. this thing. <laughs> no, I think you don't want that. Oh. So, let's, let's just, uh, so let's take a quick break. We're going to hear from Jen and this week in tornado history, Tony Rice, by the way, was out in, I think, Arkansas or Texas today. He sent me a note. He's traveling back but we've got Jen and uh this week in weather history and uh we'll come back with uh bruce and picks of the week and much more as weather brains rolls along this week in tornado history the red river valley tornado outbreak was one of the most significant outbreaks on record for this region it occurred on april 10th 1979 for the Storm Prediction Center, 25 tornadoes occurred mainly in Texas and Oklahoma with one lone tornado in the state of Kansas Two F4 tornadoes occurred during the outbreak. One hit the south side of Vernon, Texas, and the other struck Wichita Falls. The Wichita Falls tornado had a path length of almost 47 miles. It had a maximum width of close to one mile, and it reached that mile width as it entered the Faith Village neighborhood on the north side of Southwest Parkway. Most of the homes in this area were demolished. 
Tragically, 42 people lost their lives from this tornado event. 25 of the deaths were auto-related, and 16 of the 25 were people who entered their cars trying to evade the tornado. 11 of these 16 people left homes that were not even damaged. A total of 3,095 homes were destroyed in this event, and 600 were damaged. Over 1,700 injuries were reported. Ted Fujita surveyed the damage from this outbreak, and for the National Weather Service in Norman, he noted that the damage path of the Wichita Falls tornado was among the widest that he had ever seen. You can read about this event and hundreds more at tornadotalk.com. Join the American Meteorological Society's weather band at amsweatherband.org to connect with weather enthusiasts all over the world, plus 10,000 plus members of the AMS. Swap stories and data, join photo contests and interactive webinars, or test your trivia knowledge. Full membership is just $12 per year. On Wednesday, April 3rd, AMS Weather Band will be hosting a special 90-minute webinar entitled A Day That Changed Tornado Research, a look back at the 1974 super outbreak. Panelists will discuss this historic day's synoptic setup and operations and some of the outcomes from research conducted on this event. Register at amsweatherband.org. And this is the last week that we'll have uh, our friends from the AMS Weather Band. Hopefully they'll be back soon, but I'm looking forward uh, to the recording of uh, last week's event uh, being on their website. So I'm excited to see uh, Dr. Kim Cloco McLean join us with her eclipse experience there in Southeast Oklahoma. Kim, it looks like you dressed up, got some wine and an Airbnb and some, uh, looks like some fun being had there in Southeast Oklahoma. Hey, party time. <laughs> yeah. And we're about one hour out, I think from, or not even, no, actually we're like seven minutes out from the start of the Purdue basketball game. So, uh, yeah, I'm I'm keeping oh, it, my fingers it, crossed. It, it, at least one of us ended up in the national championship game. So good for you, Kim. Oh, no, uh, I'm sad that we couldn't all talk about it last week. I, or, that I wasn't there to talk about it as well because it would have been an epic Weather Brains showdown if Alabama. It would have been. been. It would have been. Now, now we just had our, our head coach uh, in a soundproof room hoping he doesn't go to Kentucky. Um, so I don't know what that's he, he, ju about. he just put out a statement saying he's not going. He just uh, 10 minutes ago, put out a statement. Did you talk to him, James? I hope you reasoned with him. Uh, no, he just, uh, okay. I, he did that I think, I think he, 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 he just got a new gig, a new contract and it's very lucrative. And I think he's, he's doing okay. Well, good luck tonight, Kim. How was the eclipse for y'all where you were? Man, today was something. We had a lot of cloudiness early on in um, southeast Oklahoma over McCurtain County, which is where all of the tourists were. And I was texting with Nate Johnson, our former weather brain and kind of forever weather brain. He's just across the highway from me. And um, o Oklahoma James, uh, James ate a lot. He was down here too, or he was heading this way. And we were all going to convene at somebody's cabin, depending on where the clouds were setting up, well, we all ended up chasing um, into Arkansas or toward Arkansas because the clouds were just looking too stout here. Um, now, if we'd stayed at the cabin, apparently, 10 minutes before totality, that cloud deck cleared. But I think I would have had a heart attack before totality would have started. So that would not have been excellent. Um, I wouldn't have lived to see it either. Anyway, but we got to go to Arkansas and... Um, had a wonderful time. We saw the the clouds erode as the shadow overtook North Texas and Southeast Oklahoma and the Southern part of Arkansas. And just that, watching clouds vaporize and everything get dark and everyone, you know, when totality hits, everything they say is true. It's just incredible. Yeah, I hope you guys are enjoying the show around me. I've got crickets, I've got people walking by with wine. <laughs> <laughs> I can take people up to the fire out back. We've got a big bonfire. Things are going to go down here at this cabin. I, I love, I love the crickets. I this is like the one time where I wish we had dead air, just so there's actual <laughs> crickets in the background. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, I'm hoping that today will end on as wonderful a note as um, you know it's been throughout the rest of the day. We got to have a, an anti-storm chase. And my whole family loved that. And um, yeah, I think it's been it's been a memorable day. 
Well, that's very exciting. So you you did get to see totality, Kim. Was yes. that was was that the first time you've ever gotten to do that, or have you had multiple experiences? I've never seen it. My parents saw it in 2017. I'm here with my parents and my husband's parents, uh, all in a cabin. That's part of why we have. Um, but we're all here. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 great. But some of them had seen, my folks had seen before, but the rest of us hadn't. So it's well, it, been. Kim was, uh, Jen was mentioning it was a very emotional experience. I had seen it before too. This was much more spiritual for me. The other time I was managing kids and trying to make sure they put the glasses on, took the glasses off, and didn't end up blinded by the whole thing. And, uh, you know, today was just much more relaxed than just me and my eclipse glasses. And my big fancy seat, and uh, you know, just me and me and the the sun and the moon, and it was a lot of fun. Oh, and yes, I, I had a little bit of yes playing in the background, but uh, so I'm glad you got to join us, Kim. We we uh, we're hoping you would be here, uh, and we talked about some stuff earlier that we're going to get into on another episode where we need your your expertise, but um, mostly we wanted to hear about your fun day today. So that's great. We're joined by Bruce Jones, as we always are this time of the week uh, from Midland Radio. Bruce, we were just talking about, uh, you know, we, we've got a real burden on our hearts, you know, here, especially in the South and Tornado Alley, where manufactured housing is, you know, such an important part, uh, you know, of, of, of life. Uh, it's an important, you know, form of accommodation for a lot of people. Um, and, and we wish there were laws in these states that, you know, had a NOAA weather radio coming uh, with, you know, each one of those mobile home purchases. Uh, that sounds like such a good idea, but it seems like that, you know, uh, I'm only a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill yeah. on Capitol Hill. That's not probably something we'll ever get done. I don't think so. Uh, I, you know, I think maybe the only hope is to appeal to the insurance industry and see if they can encourage their uh, policyholders to have a NOAA weather radio in their home. Certainly, smoke detectors help uh, a lot, and we found that out in uh, throughout history. But if you had a storm detector in your home, uh, for one thing, you could move your car into the garage so it wouldn't get hail damage. And, uh, you know, you bring your kids down to the basement so they're uh, not injured or or worse. So I've often thought that maybe the key to the whole thing is to get the insurance industry uh, talking and uh, I'll be appearing with the National Association of Insurance Commissioners coming up here in another month and a half or so down in uh, Mississippi, I think it is. We're having a conference down there and it'll be a topic of discussion. But yeah, <clears throat> you know, uh, marginal homes like that are affordable homes. Um, a lot of people, uh, that's a starter home for a lot of people nowadays, or a permanent home for many others. And we need to make sure that they're protected. So the number one thing you can do if you do live in a mobile home or an older home is to have one of these NOAA weather radios. And those of us on Weather Brains and who listen to Weather Brains, please help us spread this message. These devices are lifesavers. And especially when the local cell phone tower gets blown down or knocked out by lightning, if you're just relying on your cell phone alone and your nearest cell phone tower is not operational, you're not going to get anything on your cell phone. So it's important to spread this word about how these devices save lives. And they're very affordable too. We, we know that a lot of people don't wanna spend a lot of money on another electronic gizmo. So most of these uh, public alert certified weather radios, you can get them for maybe 35 or $36. And that's a that's a really inexpensive life insurance policy. So if you're a Weather Brains listener, we've got a special offer for you. We have Mother's Day coming up, Father's Day coming up, a lot of weddings this time of year, and then you know baby showers. These these devices make wonderful, wonderful gifts. Absolutely wonderful because you could save someone's life with this. And if you go to midlandusa.com, midlandusa.com, and use the promo code SPAN25. That's S P A N N two five. You'll get twenty five percent off all the weather products and accessories. So, portable weather radios. If you're going uh, camping, if you're going traveling, uh, an emergency crank radio is good to have in the hurricane zones. If you have to evacuate or shelter in place, but most importantly, get one of these little white desktop public alert certified weather radios. That public alert certification is a real deal. It's not advertising. 
A public alert certified weather radio has to have a minimum 77 decibel alert tone. It has to have battery backup. It has to have lights on there that notify the deaf and hard of hearing of what's going on. And most importantly, it has to have an external alert port on the back of the radio where you can plug in a strobe or a pillow shaker for the deaf and hard of hearing. So these devices, these public alert certified weather radios, like the white one there that you see on the screen, these were designed to truly save lives. So think about that for yourself, for your own family, and for others in your family and your neighborhood as well. 25% off at Midland USA when you use the promo code SPAN25. And Jen, there more, you have a story there that you need to share before James uh, wraps up our Bruce, Bruce Jones segment. I was what I was using my radio today to uh, listen to 101.7 classic hits so I could hear all the eclipse playlist and I had my AM and FM weather radio right by my side and as we went totality it was blinded by the light I thought it was just perfect <laughs> I I just oh man I loved it it was it was quite the experience that's for sure Bruce and um yeah so I was glad to have that by my side Manfred Mann. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm worried about James. could hit the post. But Bill says he's listening to Yes. What, what, what are you listening that? to? Roundabout? What, what are you listening to? Yeah, uh, yeah Roundabout was, was the main one. It was, uh, I used to have, I used to have that big triple done. album, Bill. They had you that did? Big triple <laughs> yes album. Yeah, I had that one. Yeah. yeah and, uh, and, and, uh, and Grand Funk Railroad, my captain. Uh, that was a pretty good one too. Yeah, but Bill looked like a stoner sitting back in that chair. Hey, man, uh, yeah, I'm gonna listen to some ye yes, man, and Grand <laughs> Funk and uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so, so no, but but uh, again, Bruce, the the it is still amazing to me how many people don't have a weather radio because they believe and again I, I go back to what i said at the beginning of the show for those that weren't on the beginning of the show my favorite thing to do when i go to schools every day to stop at a dollar general and talk with real people that we serve and i hear it over and over well i don't need one of those that's 30 dollars. i got i'll hear the sirens before the tornado that thinking is dangerous, Bruce. That's bad. Yeah. And you know, James, what I've noticed in Alabama, a lot of your emergency managers have been listening to you on that because I think Alabama is the most proactive state in moving people away from a reliance on outdoor sirens and pushing them toward indoor sirens, NOAA weather radios. I've noticed it with a lot of the emergency managers down there. And I want to thank you or pressing that message in the state of Alabama. And let's just hope that it goes nationwide. Yeah. And, and again, you know, sirens have a purpose and they reach a few people outside, but uh, yeah. uh, we have got to do a better job. Those of us that are professionals and those that are weather enthusiasts of letting their friends and family members know that you have to have this in your home or in your business and now is the perfect time to take advantage of that opportunity. So again, that's a big deal. Neil, Neil, you you, you never told your travel story. We got to hear it. Go. Oh, all right. I, I can't yourself. wait. Brace yourself. Um, so I'm flying back. Yeah, you know, I mean, I was I was telling you earlier. I was I had to get out of town so I could get back here. Um, so I made my first flight. My connection was super short. I think it was like five minutes, and I had to run like clean across the entire Charlotte airport. Uh, so I get on the plane and I'm sitting down and it's like five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and we're not taking off. And then the first officer comes on and he's like, um, got some bad news. Uh, turns out that the captain has had some stomach problems <laughs> and, <laughs> and had to run off the plane really quick. And I just oh, thought, boy. oh, and then, and then he's like, and he's not going to be able to f do the flight. And I just thought, oh, man, this is bad. Um, <laughs> so so I'm sure I don't know what was going on with this poor guy. I'm sure he was in the bathroom doing something. But then then a guy comes on and he's like, but we're, we're looking for somebody else who can fly the plane. We're, 
<laughs> Thank you, volunteers. <laughs> we're we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna keep everyone on the plane while we find a new captain. And so I'm kind of I'm sitting kind of near the front, and like one of the flight attendants was kind of joking around, and I think they were talking like like one of the other like you know people up near the front, and I can't remember if they had the PA on or not, but it was loud, and and she, she was like, oh. Well, you know, they're probably just up there in the terminal looking and looking to see if anyone's in the bars. <laughs> oh, 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 gosh. And I, I was like, I I don't know that they're actually like looking for, for captains in the bars or whatever. But what was funny was like every everyone like in the front part of the plane like heard people laughing about it. And and then like probably 15, 20 minutes go by and then the first officer comes on and I think he heard this whole thing too. And he's just like, Oh, good news, everybody. We found a, we found someone to a new captain to fly the plane. Meanwhile, this guy has no idea like this entire conversation happened in the plane. And so he gets on the plane and this guy is like Ned Flanders. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he picks up the mic and he's like, Good afternoon, everybody. And he's just like instantly, she's like, today we're going to have a great flight. We're going to be flying at like 25,000 feet. And I, there's no way in hell this guy drinks at all. And did, did, did he start with, hey, diddly oh, neighbors? Well, what was funny was he like walks in and starts, as soon as he starts talking, everybody starts laughing. And I'm sure he's like, what's, <laughs> what's so funny? Mm. And uh, so, yeah, so anyway, I, you know, flight was a little bit delayed, but not a big deal. And apparently, I guess these pilots are just hanging out in the airport, like waiting for a flight to call. <laughs> you never know. Bring me another captain. Did, did we ever did we ever check on the condition of the, the, the captain and had to blow out in the bathroom? I mean, is he, is he OK? I mean, do we? <laughs> he, he, he stopped by your TV session a few weeks ago, James. I hear I hear you've been having a perpetrator running oh, around yeah. the state. Oh, we, we've got a real perp that's in this building somewhere that blows out our bathroom here. But it just said, well, all right, well, before before we go down the tubes, uh, I, I do want that he's taken to going to the bathroom on the other side of the of the building since you've been on this this cause. To yeah, try to find there's the clearly a, somebody with the lower GI problems here. But um, <laughs> Jen, did, did, if you. Have you got an email to read, or do we need to move on to the next uh, thing here? I, I don't want to miss your segment. Uh, no, we can we can move on. We'll yeah. I, I haven't had okay. A lot we, we, yeah, yeah. I, I yeah, we're not this into the basketball game. We got to hurry up. Here. Kim's got to. Yeah. That's right. We we get, we, we we got to wrap this thing up because Kim's got to watch the the national championship game is on tonight. Real quick before we did picks of the week here, I thought thoughts on the hurricane season, Neil. What 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 are you thinking here? We're getting close. I think it's going to be bad. I, at least the Atlantic. I mean, I don't. There's no way around it. The every time we go from an El Nino to a La Nina, there's going to be suppressed heat buildup because of the pre-existing shear that was blocking development before. And with that shear that's not there anymore, and the water temps are way high, I think it's going to be bad. I heard. I heard Colorado release their forecast. I haven't seen it, but it wouldn't surprise me if it's the worst ever. Um, I would, you know, and, you know, whether or not they make landfall, who knows, but there's a lot of energy and, and upper level conditions should be pretty favorable. So I, I would, you know, I'm a lot more concerned this year than the, than the two previous years. Strap in. Yeah. You never know where they recurve into the westerlies, but I, I agree. And if you know, Klotzbach came out with his forecast, what, last week and, uh, I don't have it in front of me, but it was very aggressive. And the thinking is the same as yours. So, um, yeah, I think it was uh, 21 storms, 12 hurricanes and five major. And the, and the ace was through the roof. Yeah. I mean, I think that might even be conservative. Mm -hmm. You know, this could be a long, long summer, uh, because June 1st is coming fast but let, let let's get jen to her basketball game here so let's do picks of the week where we're going to go around the horn everybody shares something that is weather related you guys know how this works we have no guest on the show tonight so my pick it's simply the nasa replay of the eclipse a lot a lot of people you know a lot of people forget that folks work during the day and some people don't have the option of you know going out even just going out in the parking lot they they don't they just can't 
you know, dispatchers and things like that. They just don't. So if you want to see a replay from different places in, in the path of the totality, uh, just uh, the, the link that I'll have is from the uh, NASA replay uh, today. So that's my pick of the week. All right, Kim, we got to get you in and out so you can go watch some basketball. What you got anything for us this week? Well, inspired by Neil's story, that is the only tenuous thread that ties this to meteorology. Um, speaking of that pilot who went missing and nobody wanted to see how he was doing, there's a comedy sketch sketch that is just classic um, from Mitch Hedberg called What About the Dufresnes? And it speaks directly to this. Highly recommend. <laughs> okay. okay. I can't wait to see this. We'll put the links up on weatherbrains.com. All right, uh, Jen, uh, give us something, something. So mine is, um, we, I don't know how we did it, but we wrote this in record time. It's our overview and it ended up being fifth, over 15,000 words. It was the overview for the Xenia F5, April 3rd, 1974. Um, Zach and Nelson and I cranked this out and we were able to release it uh, right before the anniversary. And I, I'll tell you real quick, I, I emotionally crashed last week and I, I can only imagine how folks who had commemorations and uh, that was a huge deal for the 50th anniversary of the 74 outbreak. And I went to Louisville and I was so wanting to see John Gordon and he was surveying. So I didn't get a chance to see him. They had invited me to speak and I had the opportunity to speak with the mayor of Louisville, Harvey Sloan, and then Dr. Greg Forbes spoke. And I got my selfie with Dr. Forbes. I'm like, Dr. Forbes, do you do selfies? He's like, well, I do. And I'm like, yay. And so I got a selfie with him and he's amazing. And then I, I got a chance to speak and it was just awesome. And then on my way back home, I stopped in Xenia. And it was a very emotional experience. I didn't know a lot of folks, but I just kind of walked around and I listened to the speaking. And then I there were over 250 people that showed up at the senior center for this um, anniversary and I snuck out after a little while. I talked to the weather service folks and and then I just kind of snuck out. I felt like I was at a family reunion and I knew everyone because I wrote their story, you know, and I there's we'd only scratched the surface, but I knew everyone, but they didn't have a clue who I was. And I was just there to pay my respects. I was it was very emotional. It was very amazing to see how such an event had bonded everyone together. And I know it was a very similar experience for Gwen. And when Zach went, and I, James, you were there for the for the Gwen ceremony, and I watched it online. I boohooed during that one. Um, I just, it, it was just, it was powerful. But the the camaraderie and the community with all that and, and rallying together, it was just something I've I've never really experienced. And and so uh, we have a lot more to share with the Xenia story, and I'm excited to to tell more and more stories. Um, this is just the the start of it with our Xenia overview. So I wanted to share that with folks to to just kind of kick back and and read what happened on that day. Awesome, and yeah, I I will say um, I enjoyed my time in Gwen last week. Uh, they held the service on Wednesday evening, and uh, which was April third, uh, the the day of the fiftieth anniversary, and. Uh, uh, we, it was good. A lot, some of those folks I've known for a long time. And again, for, for, you heard my story last week, but I was there as a teenager and, uh, it, it changed my life. The whole thing was a life changing experience for me and being able to go back and being invited to be a speaker. Goodness. I was honored. I'm just some goober. Uh, why me? I, I, I don't know, but, uh, uh, it was great to see Mayor Phil, uh, we all went to dinner after the service. We had a great time, and uh, and and I and I told Phil, Phil, there's something wrong with you. You, you, this man's hair has not moved in 30 years. I mean, the, the guy has the the greatest <laughs> hair of any mayor in the United States. Uh, but uh, again, we had some folks here from the National Weather Service in Birmingham. They came up, and uh, uh, again, uh, just very touching service. And the the. The thing that we all want is for people not to forget the ones that died, even though it's been 50 years. We just don't want their names to be scrubbed from our memories. We just want them to uh, stay alive. And it was a good service. It was just great. It was it was so good. But you're right. It was kind of an emotional week. All right, Bruce Jones, uh, give us a good pick. Hey, uh, two weeks ago, I missed the show because I, I was up in uh, Spokane. I actually watched the show on the uh, the Southwest flight from Spokane to wherever. Uh, but if you ever fly over eastern Washington, and a lot of flights will take you over eastern and southeastern Washington, 
if you get a window seat, you can look down and see where these enormous Ice Age floods flooded across that area back about 15,000 years ago. There was a series of them because as the glaciers were melting, they built up these huge lakes of water that would get clogged up with basically icebergs. Eventually that clog would break and these enormous 200 foot fall, tall walls of water would come down. And there's a US geological survey site on the internet about it. It's called, uh, and there's a book. This book is on the trail of the Ice Age floods. And if you'll just Google Ice Age floods, uh, USGS has a nice website about it, but you can see it from the air when you fly over it. And you can tell there was once not just one, but several enormous flash floods that came through and just completely scoured that area. The first clue they had, uh, James, was they would find these odd rocks way up 400 feet up on the top of a mountain, rocks that came from down below. How did they get up there? And they, they finally surmised after years that it was a series of enormous flash floods. Wow. Fascinating. All right. And again, we'll put the link up on uh, weatherbrains.com. Uh, Neil, give us something good. Um, so I know I've, I've given this pick of the week before and it's somewhat time sensitive. So if, if you're, if you're listening, you should really go right now and check it out before the files get deleted. But the college of DuPage, uh, which I love awesome website, uh, go to their visible satellite animation loop and put it in the continental sector and put it on like 100 or 200 frames and watch the shadow of the eclipse go across the the country. It's pretty awesome looking. Yeah, yeah, it, it is way, it is too stinking cool. I mean, how, how many days are you going to see that uh, rolling through uh, uh, in April? That, that's great, great pick. And again, we'll put the link up on weatherbrains.com. By the way, Bill, before I throw it to you, I wanted to mention one little plug here. Uh, Friday evening, I will be speaking to the AMS chapter at Northern Illinois University, west of uh, Chicago. So if you're in uh, Chicago land, I believe it's open to the public. We'd love to see you there. I'll put the uh, data up. Um, in fact, I'll put it in the show notes, uh, the, the location there on the campus. All right, Bill, what you got for us? Yeah, James, I'm going to take the foghorn for my pick just because no one else took it, and I was too lazy today to get a, to, well, to get a pick ready. Well, goodness. Well, hang, hang on. I've rearranged the, um, here, here we go. <laughs> the soundboard. <laughs> yeah. I rearranged the soundboard, but there I found it. There we go. Well, Dr. Dr. Jacobs, you have to be on the show next week, uh, because weather range 952, we're going to have Heather Tesh, who, uh, of course, uh, you know, is a, is a famous weather channel personality, but she has a podcast about near death experiences and uh, I think you're like a, I think you're like a, a whole series of episodes. So um, Heather is looking forward to meeting <laughs> you on the show next week. So uh, make sure you're there. Yeah, be I'll, night. I'll be there for sure. Yeah, we're going to have a fun night next uh, Monday night, the 15th with Heather Tesh. We'll join. Uh, we'll be joined by Ben Luna and his team from the Tennessee Valley Weather uh, Network on the 22nd. Our uh, old friend Johnny Parker will uh, join us that night as a guest panelist. And then the show, I'm really looking forward to uh, Christina Ballantyne on uh, Tornado Warning Visual Effectiveness with Broadcasters. That's going to be on April 29th. So, Dr. Uh, Dr. Kim, you have to be there for that one. That one's uh, a yeah, command she's, performance. She's long gone. She's long gone. Oh, I don't have my Zoom up, so I'm sorry about that. So, yeah, she's she's gone and having fun and watching Zach Eady uh, wreak havoc uh, on the national championship. Uh, but I've won my bracket this year. I don't think that's ever happened. I actually won my bracket, had the two teams in the national championship and had Alabama going all the way to the uh, final four. And uh, that that carried me to victory. So I am uh, I'm celebrating my, my brackets win this year. Wow. What, what do you win? What, what's your prize? Nothing. Just, That's what um, I thought. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right. Or, or so we're gonna let this year. we're gonna let everybody go watch the uh, the basketball game. If you're new here, we are typically on the air every Monday night at uh, eight o'clock Eastern, seven o'clock Central. You can watch the video version live on YouTube or later YouTube.com/slash WeatherBrains. But most people listen to the audio podcast. That'll be out every Tuesday morning early. And we're going to bring back the email next week. So if you need to get in touch with us, uh, just send us an email. We'd love to hear from you. It's email at weatherbrains.com.
dot com. Of course, that's where all the show notes are located. So on behalf of the entire Weather Brains crew, I'm James Spann. Thanks for listening. Have a great week and God bless. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for, being, for being here. Good old home show. 